Good morning, I'm John Powell and I'm out here in the uh, Charlotte Partridge Ordway Memorial Japanese Garden and I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, some garden lanterns and ornaments that you'll find uh, out here in the Japanese Garden. Um, there are a few different types of uh, lanterns specifically but there's also um, other pieces of material that we use in the garden that might not have originally been intended for garden construction, but have um, been uh, adapted to uh, utilize this purpose. This, this concept in Japanese is called mitate, and is a, um, it's, it's found in almost every uh, Japanese garden throughout the world, some aspect of it. And lanterns um, are one uh, aspect of mitate. Originally, they were used in, um, uh, at temples and also at burial sites for illumination and uh, during the formalization of the um, Japanese tea practice uh, the, gar the lanterns were then begin to be integrated into the garden to sometimes pr provide illumination at night. Um, when we make it over to the tea garden you'll see that there's one prominently placed right by uh, the basin and that one would have been used for illumination in case there was a tea ceremony at night so the guests could make it up to that basin. But where I am right now is on the island and uh, we have a couple of uh, different lanterns here. The first one, the smaller one with the kind of the large flat roof is called a Yukimi lantern or snow viewing lantern. Um, it's kind of a, a confusing name for it. Originally, it was called Iukimi, which meant um, almost floating. Because in the, in the use of the lantern, it's felt to be most beautiful when it's set uh, beside a pond or b beside water, where uh, the reflection of the lantern can be um, seen in the water uh, and, and, and has less to do with um, uh, snow that might accumulate on it. But the character, uh, the kanji character for you for floating was so difficult, oftentimes it just got um, simplified into you, uh, which is part of the word, word snow, and, and, and thus we have the uh, Yukimi lantern of today. In the light box area, just below the large flat roof, you can see a uh, crescent uh, type moon. And so when we set these lanterns, um, if there is a light or, or, or some carving in the light box, especially a sun or a moon, we arrange it so that it aligns with the normal sunrise and moonset uh, that you might experience, which is essentially uh, east and west. So on the back side of this lantern, there is a, a round cutout that would sign signify the sun. Another uh, prominent lantern that we have in the garden is the Costco lantern. And these are much taller upright lanterns that were um, originated from the Kasuga Shrine in Nara, Japan, which was the uh, capital um, of Japan uh, long ago, I think around uh, 900, so well, well over a thousand years ago. Um, Kasuga is a uh, Shinto shrine and on these lanterns on the white box in this case we often see hunting uh, motifs portrayed if um, we can zoom in on that light box area you can see a deer uh, carved in into the side uh, sometimes there would be wild boar other other types of wildlife and it was kind of a um, um, <clears throat> vote for sort of good luck uh, good luck in the hunt in uh, within the harvest. Now we've moved uh, a little bit closer to the entry of the garden and we see a really excellent uh, example of mitate or this sort of reuse of old materials for a new purpose and um, in this case this is a water fountain that came out of the old Como Park and when Mr. Matsuda came to build the garden he saw this piece and um, was intrigued by it and uh, it's sort of mild similarity to what uh, many uh, stone lanterns look like in, in shape. So um, he placed the, 
um, this 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 piece here and <clears throat> I think in a couple of meanings almost as a as a welcoming thing when you go to a shrine or a temple in Japan um, the first thing that you do is go to a large water basin um, use a ladle to do a ritual purification to sort of leave away the outside world and go to a sanctified place and so in many ways this uh, this does uh, the same here and uh, is again a great a great example of mitate okay now we've moved a little bit farther uh, into the garden actually into the area in front of the waterfall and tucked below um, kind of our signature corkscrew um, Austrian pine is another example of a Casiga lantern. Um, the Casiga, as I mentioned, has different motifs of hunting. This one, perhaps uh, a rabbit, not kind of hard to see right now. But another thing that's always very prominent in the Casiga lantern is this middle portion, this middle shelf called the Chudai. And the inscription usually on the bottom of this is in the shape of a lotus flower. Uh, so another very common element uh, of Kasuga type lanterns. An interesting point about this one is it's um, missing one of its parts. And it's this top finial piece called the giboshi. So many times these disappear uh, over, the, over the centuries and they are replaced with something else and in this case uh, Mr. Matsuda found a, uh, a nice uh, garden stone that could come in and replace the top. It's really difficult to know uh, the actual origins of all of these lanterns. The first lantern, the Yukimi lantern, was uh, donated by Mr. Matsuda when a, uh, a group went over to Nagasaki to meet with him. He uh, took it out of his uh, nursery garden company and, and made it as a donation to, to the garden. Some of the other guard, uh, lanterns, though, are sort of assembled out of pieces of different lanterns. So it's a, it's a little bit difficult to know exactly if this pedestal uh, was meant for this lantern or for another one like it. Some of these pieces uh, likely originated with the 1904 World's Fair. Um, so uh, nice, uh, nice pieces of history here in the garden. Now we've moved over to the uh, Mugo Hill area of the garden, noted for all of the Mugo pines uh, surrounding us. <clears throat> and we have another version of a Casiga lantern with a slightly different um, type of uh, roof construction. But if we look on the light box, we still see these very um, uh, common kind of uh, motifs of, of hunting. An interesting point about this lantern, besides its um, use of a, of a natural boulder as its, as its finial piece, as the old one was lost, is that that middle shelf, the chudai, that holds the light box, in this case, is assembled upside down. But we can really see the carving on the, on this, um, of the stone to represent the petals of the lotus. So if in a perfect world, we would have it the other way, um, but it's kind of a kind of a fun whimsical point uh, to see it uh, to see it like this. We've made our way down to the tea house and garden, and while Japanese tea gardens aren't uh, particularly known for their high use of ornamentation, probably uh, in fact the the exact opposite. I wanted to point out these two rectangular stone pieces that um, are an example of likely of mitate. They were some sort of cut stone that were used in some type of construction here in the Twin Cities area. But we see this motif done a lot in Japanese gardens where we will have two rank rectangles offset slightly. Um, we noticed it on the, the island in the pond where there's a bridge, uh, sometimes called the zigzag bridge. The origin of this is um, uh, goes way, way back to uh, the actually the, the Heian period and perhaps before, well over a thousand years ago, where um, poetry was written 
uh, a, a style of poetry called tanka was written on these small pieces of paper um, in this rectangular shape. Um, so the so the name for these rectangles or, or these shapes is is tanzaku and harkens back to this uh, uh, ancient sort of uh, pastime of, of much of the nobility writing poetry while they spent time enjoying their garden. So next time you come out and visit us, uh, look around and you'll see this uh, reuse of materials in this uh, offset rectangular pattern quite, quite often. Almost every Japanese uh, tea garden has this um, uh, stone arrangement, basin arrangement called the sukabai, uh, which is a part of the preparation of the guests to go inside of the tea room. This is another uh, garden ornament though, this um, somewhat, uh, I guess, almost trapezoidal type stone with a large cut out of the center. Um, it's filled with water so that the guests can approach stand on this stone in the front and do their ritual purification of washing their hands, rinsing their mouth uh, before moving on towards the tea room. In this case, this was some element used for something else that Mr. Matsuda um, saw and said, hey, can we cut this uh, hole into the top to create a basin out of it? So. Um, another use of, uh, uh, or example of, of mitate, the reuse of uh, an item from its original intent. Okay, and our last stop today is uh, inside the inner oji of the tea garden to um, the sukubai area that's typically used when um, there are tea gatherings here. Um, behind it, you'll notice a large uh, lantern of um, various origins. Mr. Matsuda assembled these pieces and when he was finished with it he called it the uh, pastiche lantern as it really um, is not uh, um, confined to just uh, just one style of construction. Um, if we look at the basin itself, this is called a chozubachi, um, it also is a piece of uh, perhaps some sort of architectural element to, to one of the older buildings in, in St. Paul um, that's also had uh, the center um, cut out so it will receive the water. So um, another fine example of, uh, of mitate and uh, garden ornament.